There's something about Australia and the regenerative agriculture movement that's going on down there that I'm just absolutely fascinated with. And the entrepreneur that's really caught my eyes is Jacob Walkie. And he has really embraced the regenerative agriculture, the food systems, even having their own food service aspect. And uh, it's been a pleasure to get to know him and visit and learn a lot more. I think that this is uh, an episode we can learn a lot from. Jacob, uh, really excited to uh, be visiting with you, buddy. I saw you on Max's podcast and then Tristan, uh, and then I was talking to Jared Lumen with uh, The Herd Quitter. He's like, oh, yeah, man, I know Jacob. He was on the podcast. So I was like, well, I, I got to visit with him uh, and figure out what all is going on down there. So I have a farmer's market in uh, Arkansas, so Southeast uh, United States, and it seems like, Jacob, we're coming at almost the same thing as you are, but from the retail side. So if you will, introduce yourself and tell us what, what you have going on there with a vertically integrated regenerative business. Yeah, sure. Well, in 2019, my uh, wife and I began a bit of a food journey. I've had recurring respiratory issues and skin issues since childhood. I used to wake up in the morning, seven, eight, nine year old, and call out for my dad, and he'd come in and he'd peel the sheets off my legs because I'd scratch my legs when I was sleeping to the point that they were bleeding, and then the blood would dry and the sheet would stick to my leg. Um, you know, I've I've sneezed and spluttered and and coughed and wheezed my whole life. And when we had our first son, uh, you know, there becomes you know you go through some changes in your life. Your 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 me time disappears, and you realize you realize that your decisions about your own life uh, don't have a hard end at where you 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 end. You know you. So if, if you're not getting the best out of yourself, you're not giving the best to your family. So we went on a bit of a journey and we ended up wanting to source Whole Foods. Uh, really, I came across Justin Rhodes online, uh, homesteading, home growing, homeschooling, home churching, you know, the whole thing, which was really uh, exciting to us. And he introduced me to um, Joel Salatin through his Great American Farm Tour. And it just, everything Joel said made sense. And I said to my father, who had 100 acres out of town, I said, can I lease the corner of the property and put some chickens and cows on it? I'm going to do this rotational grazing idea, moving my cattle all the time and chasing it with chickens just to grow some food for my wife and I. And Dad just sort of rolled his eyes and said, if you have to. And uh, that was in 2019. And we, we grew a few eggs for ourselves and raised the body of beef for ourselves. And a few other people wanted some. And uh, I'm I'm reasonably um, interested in business and I guess entrepreneurial uh, minded. And I thought, I wonder if I could build something out of this at the time. And I still do run uh, my family's bicycle store. I'm in partnership with my parents. We you know we we sell bicycles and things. We've got a, a cafe, breakfast, lunch cafe, seven days a week inside the bike shop, uh, and a few other little hustles going. So I started off as a bit of a side hustle. So, you know, fast forward to. Um, we'll fast forward to this year. We're, we're just rounding out 2023 at the moment. And, um, you know, we did probably 100 bodies of beef, 300 pigs, uh, probably 13, 14,000 broilers. You know, we run a thousand layers all year long. We've got about 25 beehives doing our own, uh, raw honey. And, and we've had our own butchery for about three years. So we realized that the biggest bottleneck in production here wasn't the slaughtering we have a few options to slaughter it's not amazing but you know they're they're doing for now but the the processing the cutting the packing the labeling was a massive bottleneck so in 2020 my wife and i realized the business was going nowhere unless we took processing into our own hands and we purchased the butchery that was closed down and empty and we renovated and 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 filled it up with equipment put some butchers on and you know that's been running ever since and um that's our sort of reasonably uh, famous 24-7 store where customers can access with a pin code. The store's open 24-7 staffless, so customers can self-access, buy all the frozen cryvac meat out of the freezer and take it home. And that's, you know, that's been running like that for three years now with a few hundred members, so going quite well. How neat. I, I think the your store idea is, is really fascinating. Um, 
what well, you you hit on the the daddy thing. I mean, that's uh, Jacob. That's why I do this, man. My oldest was diagnosed with stage four cancer uh, when he was five, and so coming at it from that health angle, and then being in the food system uh, business, you know, the local foods. The regenerative agriculture about doing things in this holistically managed way is was made too much sense as far as the solution to so much that ails us, so to speak. Uh, Joel, Joel's great. So would you say Joel is, had a, a massive impact on you? If I never saw a Joel Salatin, those first few Joel Salatin videos, I wouldn't be doing this. That's awesome. Um, I would say Joel and Alan Saver are probably two of the the biggest influencers um, out there. We had gone down to Bluffton, Georgia, and filmed a documentary with uh, Will Harris and White Oak Pastures. And uh, I know I know Alan has had a mace a massive impact on him. Uh, but what I found with spending time with Will and then seeing some of your videos and listening to some of your podcasts is there's a lot of parallels between what Will's doing and you have done on that vertically integrated side. So how how did you get to the point that you had to do more of that from the farming to even, I mean, I, I, you've gone as far as to even food service. Yeah, look, a lot, a lot of it was... I guess necessary. Like I said, when when in Australia you have the slaughterhouse and the packers are separated. So if, if you get an animal cold um, at an abattoir, we call them here, they won't butcher it and package it for you ready for sale. They just slaughter. So then it has to be traced to a certified um, boning room. We call them, which is just a butcher's facility, and they have to do the cut and po- packing. And they're all little mum and dad operations. And you know the reality is, is they're all um, overworked, understaffed, under-equipped, um, no space in the cool room. You know, like none of them had the capacity. The, the abattoirs can slip in another body of beef every week. Like it means nothing to them. It's such an efficient thing. Um, so we had to take the butchery into our own hands. Like we were, we were using one butcher in town and he said, one body of beef and two pigs a month and that's all I can do for you. And I, you know... You don't even need to write the math of that down to understand you're not going to build a business. Like you might have a little hobby doing 12 steers and 24 pigs a year, but you're not going to pay a wage. Um, so we knew that we had to integrate the butchery side of it. We didn't want to. You know, the cafe we've actually had a lot longer. The cafe we've had for about nine years now. So when we started our food journey, it was very easy for us just to run the costings and just roll that produce into the cafe. So the cafe uses all of our eggs chicken, beef, pork, lamb, um, you know, a few vegetables and fruits and, and, and honey and everything like that. And, and then over the journey, you know, we've gone seed oil free in the cafe. So we're running our griddle and our deep fries uh, off our tallow and our lard. And, and you know, we, we're getting, we've got rid of the refined sugar. So we're using our own raw honey. Uh, I don't know if a lot of our uh, customers appreciate it. Like a lot of our customers come to us because we're a cool, trendy cafe. Uh, not because of the whole food story, and it, you know, but you know, there are people that appreciate it, and you know, I couldn't, in good conscience, serve little children um, wedges deep fried in canola oil, you know. So it it is what it is. Um, you know, the vertical integration thing—it's sexy. Everyone loves it. Uh, it it is sure it gives you more control and everything, but it opens up a lot more risk. Uh, it requires a lot more capital, whether that's um, your own, you know, intellectual uh, horsepower, uh, your own resources. You know, during COVID lockdowns, we not long started the butchery. So we had the farm business relying on the butchery and we had the cafe relying on the farm business. And the abattoirs in town all started getting shut down and restricted work hours for all the lockdown stuff that happened down here. And all three bris- because I couldn't get animals slaughtered, the farm grew to a halt, the butchery grew to a halt, and the cafe grew to a halt. Um, and we only got through that because we had good relationships and, you know, we were able to, um, you know, massage our relationships with our, with our slaughterhouse and, and get things going on. But, you know, being vertically integrated does sort of expose you to um, bigger downfalls as well. Yeah, I, you know, Will... Will often cautions against being too vertically integrated. And I find, I find that interesting that, you know, you've kind of echoed, echoed that. Um, 
What does regenerative agriculture mean to you? Well, regenerative agriculture means to, um, to me is just is is regenerating the commons. You know, I've got this I've got this five pillar of production that I talk about in my keynotes and on our website and everything. And you know, we we Joel Salatin talks about the commons being water quality um, and air quality, and then he sort of pushes the limits a little bit and and says that soil health and 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 you know nutrient function and all that sort of stuff should be regarded as a common resource and i like to push the limit a little bit further because you know we, we we all want to expand on each other and i say that community health and community wealth um, should also be regarded as commons because we all we all benefit from cleaner air we all benefit from cleaner water but we also all benefit from our communities being healthier and everybody uh, living in prosperity so you know regenerative agriculture for us is trying to address those commons and build them I, I love how you threw in the whole health and prosperity. I mean, that that's what, uh, you know, we're really, really trying to get at with, you know, sowing prosperity. It's based off of Galatians 6, 7. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever man sows, this he shall also reap. And so to me, prosperity starts with health. If if you as a daddy, me as a daddy, we don't have health, we don't we don't really have anything. And so I love I love that you you threw that in there. Um, tell me. A little bit about the multi species that you're doing and how, what what all have you got going on at the well, farm? Well, I'll, I'll preface this by saying that we have too much going on. And I think people look at Joel Salatin with his chickens and rabbits and turkeys and sheep and cattle and pigs, and they look at white oak with much the same. And, you know, you know, pick your, pick your top five poster boy. Uh, in you know mixed enterprise production and it's it's sexy and I, I I want I wanted to be that and I want to be that but I also think that there's a baggage and a downside that comes along with it so currently we're doing beef pork chicken lamb eggs and honey um, and uh, you know we're doing the whole thing we're, we're moving broilers every day we're moving cattle every day pigs onto pasture with cover crops weekly sheep moving three times a week. Um, you know, tick all the boxes, doing everything um, as you'd expect for somebody in, in our game. But I think, you know, when you have so much going on on your farm, like I, I, I look objectively at my business and, and my enterprise and I think I'm doing everything well and nothing great. And I, I think that, you know, guys like Joel, he might be doing everything great because he's had 40 years 50 years, whatever it might be, you know, to build that, to build that business. But we're actually going to be entering 2024 by um, culling some enterprises and getting serious about the ones that we leave behind because, you know, I, I'm getting to the space where I think it would be more profitable, better on the family, better on the animals, better on the land to do a couple enterprises great instead of a heap of enterprises as well. What do you think that you're going to be cut? boilers? Um, and this has been something I've been wrestling with, you know, probably the last month, because if you've been following my socials at all for the last 12 months, it, people that have watched, uh, you know, me, they know I've tipped a lot of uh, time and energy and money into broilers. I've built this new uh, brooding shed, like a fully automated climate control brooding shed that does 700 birds at a time. I've built two big schooners, with automated feed, automatic water, it gets dragged in the paddock automatically by a winch. You know, I've built two of them so I can just pump um, lots of birds out of the brooder and alternate between the two sheds. And you know, I've been I've been putting out 700 birds every three weeks, which in Australia um, there's not really anyone doing more than that. There's 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 a lot of people doing that 200 to 250 birds a week, but no one's got over it. But the reality is. Is that all my headaches come from broilers? Even you know, chickens the most eaten meat. It's my it's my cheapest protein I sell per kilogram. It's the fastest to scale. It's the easiest on cash flow. All that stuff. Uh, but each batch of birds we drive about twenty hours, and two thirds of that driving is night driving. It's all my headaches come from chickens. You know, we, we've got to do an enormous drive to pick them up. 
Uh, then we've got to do a huge drive to get them slaughtered. And then we've got to do another big drive to go pick them up once they're slaughtered. And it's time away from the farm. And I'm sitting staff in cars, you know, from midnight till midday. Uh, and, you know, I'm not going to cancel broilers. We're just going to mothball the enterprise and uh, free ourselves up from all of that headspace and liability. And we're going to um, lean into everything else we've got going on a bit harder. So, like, I, if people ask me all the time, what animals should I have on my farm? If you want to do a mixed enterprise, regenerative thing, I really think you need one extensive enterprise and one intensive enterprise. And in Australia, with with um, land zoning and things, extensive enterprises are grazing ruminants, so cattle, sheep, goats, uh, and then intensive uh, monogastrics that you need to import feed for. So, you know, chickens, pigs, whatever, ducks. Uh, so we're going, you know... I, you know, we're going to keep both of our ruminants uh, because we can handle that, the sheep and the cattle, and we're going to lean into pigs over the next 12 months. We've uh, we've really taken a deep dive on the whole chicken thing. Uh, I grew up with my grandpa raising Tyson broiler chicken, so I've been on the commercial side of it and then, you know, much more passionate about, you know, the smaller scale. But I'm I'm having a hard time justifying the inputs as a as a system that is regenerative right like if we have to do all that extra to bring in to raise them it's probably not regenerative i know it has a as a niche in there and then from even the health perspective it's it's not a it's not the healthiest meat like I, I, that that argument is is really out the window uh you know recently we we i had uh, dr anthony anthony chafee kind of rank the meat and he had chicken down uh much lower than ruminant so i think that uh that's a hard pill for you to swallow, especially with that commitment. But I, I feel you're making the right choice, focusing in on the non-intensive inputs. On, on the yeah, we're ones. still going to have pigs, which are intensive, you know. But you do have the opportunity to incorporate some sort of waste stream uh, with pigs. And one thing that we're going to be mucking around a little bit is getting more serious with our cover crops for pigs. You know, we've always sowed behind the pigs, uh, but the guy I buy my wiener piglets from. Jason Bates up at Stock and Piggle, who you know runs 200 sows on pasture, does a great job. He talks about certain times of the year his cover crops are so uh, you know lush and vibrant and mature that the pigs won't come to the fence. You know we're talking gestating gilts or lactating sows; they won't even come to the fence to eat the grain he puts on the floor. It'll sit there for a week because they're in the paddock um, eating all of the the sorghum and radish and lupins and, and peas and, and and whatever it might be. And that's something that's really interesting to me. You know, what sort of nutrient density benchmarking can we do? Can we can we finish pigs off on a primarily fodder crop? You know, whatever it might be. So what we're going to muck around with is is doing the uh, cover crops, but also trying to irrigate it and time it so that it's not just twice a year. You've got this three four week you know nice pretty window where nature aligns and they've got a good cover crop. But trying to keep that feed in front of them all the time. Now, a lot of people in region ag they don't like this uh, input. They don't like irrigation or, or or they don't like you know importing feed or whatever it is. You know, with like if you've got water, you've got to use it. Just get sucked up into the atmosphere and you got to cross your fingers waiting for it to come again. You know, just because you spray water on your pasture doesn't mean it's gone. You know, there's a water cycle. You do your holistic management training and you understand there's a nutrient cycle. There's a water cycle. If it's sitting there, it deserves to be used. Um, so we're, um, you know, that, that's one thing that I'm excited about. You can't do that with the same effect to chickens. You know, the chickens want the grass short, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But with the pigs, we can grow a eight foot tall cover crop, you know, as thick as a hay bale and, and let the pigs go in it for a week and, and really see what they can pull out of that. On, on your ruminant operation with the cattle, you've got a really unique perspective that you've caught a little bit of flack uh, over, the, but I think it's brilliant. I absolutely love it. So go into a little bit on what you, you have done there to really scale scale that beef operation. Well, you know, we've done two things. The first thing, I, to begin with, I was trading cattle. So I'd go to the yards and I'd buy some store cattle and I'd finish the well, store cattle in Australia, uh, animals in um, lean condition. Uh, I love buying store cattle because they're cheap and they normally got big frames on them with not much fat on them. So you don't have to feed them to grow bone. You just feed them to put uh, meat on. 
Um, and then we'd finish them off for, you know, four, six, eight, 12 months, whatever it took and process them. And then the pricing went a bit crazy and it just didn't make sense anymore. So I wanted to breed and it took me a while to find an animal that I, I was really excited about breeding, but I found this um, African genetic called Nguni, N-G-U-N-I. And for, for, for my brain, they just suited exactly what we want out of an animal. I don't want an animal that needs um you know help pulling a calf and 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 just all the issues that come along with so many different breeds out there this is a hardy apocalyptic cow it, it's easy going you can you can breed them first gestation which i a uh, uh, first ovulation which i think is really interesting you know if 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 you have to if a cow if a little heifer calf starts um ovulating at 8 months old but you can't put a bull in with it until it's 16 months old you know, what's happening in the wild with our ruminant herbivores is the little doe that starts ovulating is is someone out there guarding her from the buck for eight months, you know, or when everything comes on season, is she bred and is she able to deliver that, um, you know, baby herself? So I, I think we've done something to our animals chasing uh, gains and growth rates and birth weights that they, they're just not easy going anymore. And these Nguni, you can breed them. Um, first cycle and they'll have a calf for you no problems and then they'll continue breeding for you until they're 15 years old they'll give you 14 calves in 15 years and this is you know um, a, a repeatable story again and again and again but the reality is is that they're a pretty new breed in Australia the South Africans that are leaving South Africa because of the governmental persecutions and uh, political climate over there are bringing these resources to, or used to it's all embargoed you're not allowed to anymore it's all blocked for biosecurity but they were bringing embryos over and so we've got about 250 purebred cows but a lot more bulls uh, so it's very hard to get purebred genetics so i bought us a, a line of bulls i've got about five nguni bulls and i've gone to my local dairy farm who raised jersey cows and i said i want to buy all your cull jerseys um so they they sent me a spreadsheet uh, pick all the cull jerseys that are empty and they these are four six eight ten fourteen sixteen year old cows that are being sent off to the meatworks to get turned into hamburger and i'm putting them in the paddock and i'm putting my goonie bulls over them and then whoever comes back in calf gets turned out to bass pasture to you know do that process and whoever comes back dry gets marked for processing and and we convert them into beef and we sell it as aged uh, dairy beef through the butchery and you know some people can't hack it but but most people love it you know I, I when i say some people can't hack it it's like not everybody loves blue cheese but the people that do like blue cheese know that it's alpha you know that's where all the flavor is you know that's the real bespoke artisan uh moldy goodness and i i relate dairy beef to that you know not everyone can handle flavor uh, we all just want high fructose corn syrup we'd all just want a buzz but you know the people that like dairy beef get it I love I love that. So how how has that reception been for the uh, the the consumer as a you know as a general? Yeah, most people love it. Yeah, I, I I've had to take dairy beef boxes off my website because I, I pre sell so many I can't fill orders. I've got a couple of customers in. I've got one family in town that um every time I process dairy beef and I put it online, they race into my butchery. And they buy all my porterhouse steaks, which are, a porterhouse is a um, is a New York strip. And like I'm talking, they'll come in and they'll buy two thousand dollars worth of strips because uh, they know I'm not going to process f uh, dairies again for another six months or whatever it might be. You know, it's got a cult following. You know, I I cop an enormous amount of blowback um, from the beef industry. Like the, the 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 beef farmers all think I need my head red. They they think I'm. Uh, producing low quality beef, they think I'm ripping consumers off. You know, how could you eat that? Yada yada yada. But this is just an example of the of the malware malware and the and the cognitive dissonance in um agriculture's brains. You know, the, the the proofs in the eating. Get out of your prejudice and listen to your consumers. We're all we, you know we need to get out of the paddock and actually talk to the consumer who's paying us. And the reality is is that everyone loves it, just about. 
I, I love it. I love that you're going against the grain. I think it's a phenomenal arbitrage opportunity that you're taking advantage of. Um, I, th- I think it's incredible. Well, the reason, so, and just, just to, <laughs> I, I've been looking at just to recap. Sorry, like people might go, why are you using jerseys? And I'm using the jerseys for um for three reasons. One is they're cheap. So at the time, I was buying these ex jersey cows for nine hundred bucks, and to buy a breeding heifer out of the market was two and a half thousand dollars. That's when I first priced these cows up. That was the market difference. So I'm like, well, I can buy triple the cows, right? <laughs> like just about, it's pretty easy. Second thing is they're fully grown and they're ovulating every month, ready to go. Um, so there's no time feeding them to grow bone or wait to them to hit maturity. And the third reason is jerseys actually have just about every trait that I want. They're a small frame cow, same as mine goonies, both hitting a mature weight of about 450 kilos. I don't know what that is in pounds, but they're a small framed animal, um, easy going, early maturing. They're great natured, great meat quality, good um, good milk production, and easy calving. So I'm just like tick 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 tick. If I'm going to breed up my Nguni herd, which means every heifer I receive out of the jerseys is a first cross Nguni jersey, and then I put an Nguni bull over that. So the next cross is a second cross, which is 75 percent Nguni. If I'm going to breed up back to purebred, it just seems like a great base because they've got all the traits that I want. I think it's brilliant, man. I love it. I, I sincerely do. So give me some uh, genetic, because I don't know if there's any Nguini here. Say it again. Nguini. I'm sorry. How do you, how do you pronounce that? Nguini. There we go. Uh, Nguini in the United States, or if there is, I, I'm not aware of it. So what are some comparable breeds like Mashona or Piney Woods, Dexter? I, I've seen some of these smaller well, cattle that ha- seem to have a know, lot of the Piney, Piney Woods about. to me are super fun cattle, and, and they're, they're a very comparable animal from what I can see. And, you know, I'd recommend if people are in the States and they're wanting a hardy animal from the reading I've done, Piney Woods seem to be a fantastic beast. But uh, you just mentioned Mashona, the uh, breed association, the Nguni Breed Association in South Africa about three months ago um, just released genomic testing and acknowledged Mashona as an Nguni ecotype. Um, so essentially, Mashona are Nguni that have been selected for um, black polled animals. So Nguni have, majority of them have horns and if you look at an Nguni, there's about 80 different colors and patterns. They're a very varied aesthetic animal, which is um, goes back to their cultural use. Like we can talk about that, but they were grown to be a very, they got a very wide gene pool and they throw a lot of different colors. There's no um, breed standard, which I think breed standards are probably the worst thing that's ever happened to breeds in general. Um, but, you know, the, the, the Mashona is a little bit, they're all black, obviously. Uh, most of them don't have horns. Uh, and they, they are an easier fleshing animal. They're a bit more muscular than an Nguni, which is a great thing. You know, I'm, I'm, yeah, same thing. If I was an American rancher and I wanted to get some genetics on the ground, I'd be going uh, straight to Piney Woods or, or a Mashona. Too, too neat. What, uh, what's next for, for y'all, Jacob? What, uh, what's the plan? I know we're, you know, looking at least, at least pausing on the broiler side. So what's, what's next and how, how do you plan on bringing it more together or more? Sure. Well, my wife and I just settled on our first property purchase, um, 12 months ago. So we're sitting here at the, at the new family farm. We've just purchased 150 acres, you know, up until this point, we've been leasing land. So we're leasing about uh, 350 acres across a few different properties, um, you know, around the region. And we've been farming our business like that for four years, but we finally just managed to, uh, to secure some land, which we're super excited about. And we've taken our family from living in suburbia and, and, you know, now we're living half an hour out of town on this farm and just having an absolute blast. We're seeing, you know, the kids are um, running inside. There's kangaroos, there's echidnas, there's possums under the, <laughs> under the floorboards. There's, Big huntsman spiders, bigger than your hand. Um, you know, m- massive millipedes everywhere. Like it's it's like a zoo out here. So you know, we're just having a lot. I got three young children, and we're just um, uh, loving it. Congratulations! That's that is phenomenal, man. I I, I love that. Um, so you got three kids. I've got four. Um, not at, well, ten to to three is uh, and and so it's a nonstop there. I have been so excited between you know Tristan and Jared and Max about the our generation stepping up like I have been tickled to know that there's this many 
of us coming together for the regenerative and more of a holistic with with health. And so what uh, give me give me a couple reasons why you're excited about the future. Well, I like as far as building a business, I think there's, you know, which is probably one of the things that gets me excited. I just think there's tremendous opportunity because the reality is, is that there's no competition. Um, you know, like everyone in, in this space gets on Instagram and looks at what everyone else is doing. And, and it feels like a pretty popular space because there's a lot of Instagram handles with a lot of small multi-species farms behind them. But the reality is, is that if you go to any supermarket, you're not going to find a single authentic regenerative product in any of them. Uh, you know, I ran the math a little while ago in Australia. And when you compare the amount of broilers that the industrial industry raises, which I think is about one and a half million per day in Australia and in the US, I think it's, uh, you know, something like a billion a week or whatever it might be. But when you look at it in Australia, it, it's, it's one and a half million a day. And if you compare it to all the partial poultry producers put together, it's 0.00001%. You know, it's four zeros removed from the decimal. Like it, it's an industry that just doesn't exist. So I, and for me, I feel like we're the, we're the pioneers of a brave new world. Uh, there's so much opportunity for people to become sophisticated and organized and, um, you know, build real businesses and make real difference. You know, like I talked earlier about our five pillars of production, which are, um, animal welfare, environmental backbone, creating healing foods, building community and making money. And we can't do those things. Like we, we can do those things by scaling our operation more and more effectively. So the more pigs I have on pasture and the more ruminants I'm grazing, the more ecosystems we're restoring, uh, you know, the more animals that are experiencing good, good welfare out on pasture in species appropriate environments, the more people that have access to healing foods, so scaling our business, scaling scales our uh, positive impact on the commons. So, you know, not only do we get to make a bit of money, hopefully, along the way, but we have all these other altruistic influences, which are really fun. So, you know, hopefully 24, we can pull our finger out and uh, get some feet on the ground. I love it. I love it. All right. One more thing for before we jump off here is um, we are seeing this massive uptick in alpha gal. And so uh, that the tick disease that it makes you allergic to mammal meat. Emu has absolutely taken off. So we have a farm here in Arkansas that she had alpha gals, whole reason she started raising the emu. So is, is that something that's common in Australia as far as actually farming emu? Well, I've never heard about that condition personally. That's the first I, I, I have heard about some people saying that they're allergic to re uh, red meat or intolerant to it, but I've never even heard it classified, and I didn't know that that was becoming a thing. Um, I've, I've I've never met, heard of, or seen an emu farmer in Australia. I'm sure there's a few around, uh, but it's not common at all. Okay, yeah, no, alpha gal, it's a it's a big deal, um, and it is absolutely. Uh, way more common than I had any idea. And so like the emu has been huge lately. What are they tracing it to? What do they think is causing it? There's a sugar in the mammal meat, alpha gal, and it uh, is causes anaphylactic reaction. Like it's, it's wow. intense. Yep. Crazy. Yeah. So, yeah. That's a Hopefully it just stays over here. Um, if, if you've never heard of it, that's probably a good thing, but uh Jacob, thank you, brother. Where can uh, we send people to follow you and see and learn more? Sure. Well, my Twitter handle, my X handle is at Jake Walkie, W-O-L-K-I. On Facebook and Instagram, we are Walky Farm. And, you know, for any Aussies listening, we've got walkiefarm.com.au where we ship boxes all up the East Coast. Awesome. Well, thank you, my friend. I appreciate the time. Um, and we'll have to, we'll have to do a follow up since this one's going to have to be shorter than, uh, I would have liked, but, uh, that is just what happens sometimes in life. Sure. Yep. Yeah. Thanks for having me, Logan. It's been good. Thank you for joining us on Sewing Prosperity. Be sure to follow along across the social media platforms, including YouTube, and be sure to go to sewingprosperity.com.